Second Peter is where we're going to be this morning, and I want to read the first two verses. I'll pray and then give some introduction here as we go. Second Peter 1, verses 1 and 2. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Loving Father, we are grateful. Grateful to have this opportunity to look into your word. Grateful to have your spirit to interact with us. Great, grateful for a like precious faith. It is precious. We're together. And Father, what a joy it is for us to have this privilege. Thank you for your word, which is forever settled in heaven. Fathers, we've come together today. We've, we've come from different experiences in our lives. Our week has been different, I believe, for each of us. We each have unique challenges. There are things in front of us that, that are hard, that are difficult. We pray that you would minister in and through your word and your spirit into our hearts. None of us have it all together here, Father. We're on common ground. We pray that you would work through the events that have come into our life to draw us closer to you, to make us more like Jesus. I pray you'll find us yielded to whatever you have for us. I pray that by the time we're done today, there will be, have been a greater measure of yieldness, yieldedness and humility from us to you. Thank you for what you've given us as far as a ministry for each and people to minister each of us in our own places, in our own spaces, to be used of you, to glorify you, and to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for this precious faith, this common faith that we have. Father, I need your help as I proclaim. The listener needs your help as they hear, as they interact, as they make decisions. I pray that our response to the word, mine and the listener, would be according to what you'd have for us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. During this pandemic, I have heard more than one person say, I don't know how I could do it without the Lord. During times of great stress, great difficulty in life, Christians have often come to me and said, I couldn't get through this without the Lord's help. I don't know how someone who doesn't have the Lord does it. We probably have all said things similar to that at some point. In desperate times, we recognize how precious faith in Christ is. In those hard times, when you're up against it, you have nowhere to turn. It is then, I think, that we see this with clear vision, how great it is to know the Lord Jesus Christ, how wonderful it is to have faith in him. Apostle Peter terms this precious faith. It is just that. Knowing Christ is that. In Christ we have something that no amount of money, no power or prestige can acquire. And that is an opportunity to know and serve him. This is precious. It's faith. That precious faith is in Jesus and it is wonderful. He's the person our faith rests upon. And he is precious beyond words. I want you to know today that faith in Christ is precious in that it touches every aspect of our life and gives great hope. It does. Faith in Christ does just that. We can easily forget that. We can easily think of our, our, our greatest asset in something we own or our, our standing before a company or, or where we're at at a job or what we have? No. I hope you know Christ. I hope you can look to him. I hope you'll walk away from this place today encouraged, understanding what you have in Jesus. So today we're beginning a journey. Now, I've been doing topical sermons for the longest stretch of my pastorate. Since mid-December, I've only done topical sermons. That is, as you know, if you've been here a while, very unusual. 
I love to land in a book. I love to take you and others through a book and learn. The Bible is 66 books, but it's written book after book after book. And so what we usually do here, if you're new, is that we usually take it verse by verse, truth by truth. We deal with the stuff that we love to deal with, and we deal with the hard things that we easily would push aside. Because as we go through a book, you just got to do it. It's right there. You have to look at it. So welcome aboard if you've never had that opportunity. So for the next 11 or 12 Sundays, somewhere in there, there'll be some interruptions with some different things we're doing. But we will walk through this amazing book of Second Peter. Let's notice, first of all, that this precious faith, it is precious. It's precious in identity. Look at how Peter describes himself here. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. He's a believer. A bit of introduction here would help, I think. Peter's clearly identifying himself as the author. He writes toward the end of his life. Look at verse 14. It says, Knowing this, that laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent. So this is like, this is the last book that Peter would write. We don't, we, we believe he's within a year of his death here. And he's got something to say. I saw this past week a, a, a grandmother, 90-something years old. She'd been given a shirt, and it said, I'm 90-something, and I know things. I love that. There's something to learn here. This guy's been around the block. His life is an amazing life of failure and triumph, of pride and wrong decisions and spiritual highs like I believe like few have had. He loves the Lord. He's been transformed by grace. He is an ordinary person that God uses to do extraordinary things. Uh, we, Peter could say, are... Are witnesses of his glory. He saw saw the Lord that, but he was he was empowered. I, I mentioned this some time ago, supernaturally by the Spirit of God, back in the Book of Acts, to having uh, within just over a month previously failed miserably, but to be used of God in a wonderful way to to start the beginning of the church. Church was born in Acts two, and Peter stands up and preaches that sermon. But he writes to those who are scattered. They've been persecuted. He, he wrote to stir them up. Look at verse 12. Therefore, he says, I'll always uh, be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth, which is present within you. I consider it right, verse 13, as long I'm, as I'm in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. And so he writes to remind them, chapter 3, Verses 1 and 2 speak of that same truth. Peter's writing to remind them of, of certain things, to bring some new stuff for sure. But you know, that's the Word of God, isn't the ministry of the Word of God? Often we come to a text and we said, well, I've read that 80 times or 20 times or 5 times. And we're reminded of precious truths there. And the Spirit brings us along and teaches us new things. And Peter's saying, I'm writing to remind you. I want, you to, I want you to understand. And why he's doing this is there was false teaching going on. False teachers and false teaching. The second chapter, we'll deal with that when we get there. But he wants to stir them up by the word of God. But he is a testimony. Peter is. Listen to me. He's a testimony of the wonderful grace of Jesus Christ. If I ask for a show of hands, how many of us have never failed Jesus? If we were honest, we could none of us lift our hands. That's the grace of God. There's forgiveness, there's grace, there's hope in Jesus. And so he's, he's a testimony to that. When Peter first started following Jesus, he was just a babe in Christ, just like we all are. But he grew by the circumstances, the difficulties, the challenges, the triumphs, and the big mistakes. He kept looking to the Lord, and God's grace was sufficient. He experienced dramatic failure, spiritual highs that few have known. But God used every one of those events to make him in to the man that he now had, had become. And I want you to know that the things that come to you and I, God desires to use them to make us more 
like Jesus, to further the ministry that he has through us to those around us. God's got a purpose in it. And failure doesn't have to be final. Let's remember that. Failure does not have to be final. He's a, he's a testimony to that. Well, he, 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 we're talking about this precious faith. It's precious in identity, in who he is. Peter refers to himself in this letter as, as, as Simon. That was his Jewish name. Simon Peter, he is sometimes referred to. And it's a combination of his Jewish name and Christian name. Jesus gave Peter this, as, and he called him Cephas here in John 1. 42. He brought him to Jesus. That is, Andrew brought Peter to Jesus. What a story. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You should be called Cephas, which translated is Peter. Cephas is the Aramaic, Aramaic, Aramaic equivalent of Peter. Peter means rock, and that's just what he became under the leadership and the grace of Jesus Christ. So that's who he is. Let's note what he is as well. Look at it again. Simon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's what he is. He's a follower of Jesus. That's who he is. He has a precious faith just like ours. We'll get to that in a moment. What he is, bondservant. Well, it doesn't sound very appealing, does it? Let me talk about that a minute. It means to be a slave to Christ. Wow. Now, that sounds just like the opposite of what I would think I would want to be. But I want you to know that many in Scripture are identified as servants or bondservants. Moses, Deuteronomy 34, 5. So Moses, the servant of who? Of the Lord. Moses, the servant of the Lord. Others, Joshua 24, 29, came about after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord. The servant of the Lord. That's what Joshua was. That's what Moses was. David, 2 Samuel 3.18, Now then do it for the Lord has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David. What a great word. There are others. We could go on and on. I love what Mary says. She's told she's going to carry the Savior in a miraculous way. She, I'm sure, had plans like everyone else about life, knew how it was going to work out. That was interrupted by God. This is her response. Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord. There are others, Jude and so forth, Paul, Romans 1, 1, Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus. I don't know that there could ever be a greater compliment to any Christian than that of being a servant of the Lord. Peter isn't enslaved to some human institution, to a slave owner. No, he is enslaved to Jesus Christ by choice, by choice. To identify oneself as a bond slave to Jesus means this. It means that he possesses me. He owns me. In other words, he's my master. It means that we are at his disposal be, to be directed and used in any way he's fit to further his agenda, not ours. It means that we see our lives as being in constant service to him. Everything I do ought to be a reflection, my behavior in it, my attitude in it, as if I'm serving the Lord. It also means this. Listen closely. It means that I am set free from my own agenda to enjoy the greatest freedom I could ever have that God has created me for. That's what it means to be a bond slave or a bond servant, a servant of of the Lord. I will tell you, my best days are right there. My worst days are when I'm running the show, when I want what I want, when I uh, look at life as being mine, when I want to do what I want to do, when I get my heart right. Oh, there's joy because God is working, he's leading me, and I get to do what he calls me to do. 
not only a slave, a bond slave, but he was an apostle as well. Again, his life is an absolute testimony to the grace of God. I love his life. It encourages me because I see him as a man, a man who struggled, a man who fought with his own pride, a man who at, at times got ahead of himself. But here's Peter. He's an apostle, and he is serving. An, an apostle had to have seen the risen Christ. Peter did. That's a good time to remember, isn't it? He's risen. Amen. That's, we serve a risen Christ. And Peter, as an apostle, it was that teaching, his teaching, Paul's teaching, others, that the foundation of the church was laid and stands upon their teaching. What a high and mighty privilege the apostle had. Peter's faith, it's, it's a precious faith. It's a precious faith, not only in identity, not only in identity, but also in association. Look at verse 1, the rest of that. To those who have received a faith of the same kind, that, that could be termed for precious, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's precious in association. The same kind as ours, put them both on the same level as children of God, as followers of Christ. Peter was, was Jewish, an apostle, and a slave of Jesus. He wants the readers, he reminds them, and he wants them to understand that their, their faith is the same kind of faith. We have that in common. Peter isn't dismissing the fact that his leadership position, he's not doing that, but he's saying, you know what, as, as followers of Christ, we have common ground. For the cross is level for all of us. Through faith in him, anyone who believes is justified. Anyone and everyone. You don't, have to ha you don't have to have a life that looks all pretty good, and then you can come to Christ, or you can, could not have sinned down to this degree. No. The foot of the cross is level. We are told a wonderful truth here. Romans 5.1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We. The Apostle Paul is writing the church at Rome, a number of churches. And he's saying this, we're together in this. We have been justified or declared right by God. And we have peace with God. What an amazing truth. You know, the greatest saints and the least of the saints, as we would see them, we're just believers. We're followers of Christ. All have made mistakes. All have messed up. All have needed forgiveness and grace. And it's grace upon grace upon grace. So this faith is, it, it, it's in a common Savior. But I want you to know there's humility here with the apostle as well, 1 Peter 5.1. I love how he does this. He's writing to the church leadership. He says, says this, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder, fellow elder and witness of the sufferings and so forth, Christ. He's saying this, I'm not, I, I am the Apostle Peter, but I'm not saying I'm up here and you guys are down there. Matter of fact, with the elders, there's common ground here. I'm not lifting myself over that. And what humility in the Apostle's heart that he would do this. I believe that in time over his life, his failure, his difficulty, those great days, they shaped this attitude in him. I think it's an attitude we all need to remember. We have a wonderful association with everyone who names the name of Christ all across this world, and for all eternity we'll have that. We should never, though, never think ourselves up here. You know, I really got it together. Man, glad I'm not like that, Christian. They just can't seem to get it right. No, no, no. We're, we're brothers and sisters connected by the same grace, the same forgiveness that God has poured out through time to each and every one who would believe. So it's precious in association with their faith. We have a common faith in Jesus Christ and with their Savior. What a Savior. What a Savior. His righteousness is imputed on us. We've been justified by faith. 
and we stand before him forgiven, forever his child, justified or declared right by God. What a connection. What a connection. These last couple months, uh, they've been really, really difficult for me, for you, I think for all of us. We remember we are a family. We are connected through the blood of Christ, a precious faith. We are to be together. We are to assemble. We're a family. And we are sheep. Sheep are communal. They need to be together. And I have to tell you, uh, coming Sunday after Sunday and having no one in those pews, we connected online. We sure did. But I'm telling you, there's a reason to get together, and that is face-to-face. -face. What an encouragement. The Spirit of God works. We're encouraged. Nothing like being together. I praise God for that. Nothing like common faith. What a connection. What a connection. Precious. The apostle says it's precious. This faith is precious in association. How wonderful to have brothers and sisters. And it's precious in desire. Look at verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. By the way, verse, the last part of verse 1 talks about this righteousness of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is that. He's our God. He's our Savior. His righteousness is our righteousness through faith. And here we have this. This is precious in desire. Here you really see. You really see the heart of of the apostle. You really see the heart of Jesus here is what you see. What does he want? What's his desire for those he's, he's, he's writing to? What, what's, his, what's his desire? What's his heart? What's, his, what's he wishing for them? We could say, grace and peace be multiplied to you. That's what he wants. Uh, multiply, multiplied peace. Uh, multiplied here has the idea of full, of increasing, and to abound. Yesterday, I was heading to my house. There's a like a 60-acre field of alfalfa. And it was the time of day when all the dandelions are in bloom and that yellow. It, it was amazing to look across that field. And I know farmers don't like dandelions. Uh, we don't want them in our yards, right? Give them an inch, they'll take a yard. That's what a dandelion does. But it's so beautiful. You think of the beauty of that. Now, they multiplied. You couldn't count them. They were without number. That's what the apostle wants as far as grace and peace for his listener, that it would be full, that it would be increasing, that it would abound. That's what God wants for you. He wants this grace to flow, to flow, to flow. Remember, we're saved by grace. Sometimes we think of grace just in that moment, and we forget we live this life by faith, and grace upon grace upon grace flows from our Lord to us. Peter's saying, may it multiply. And he could say, I know what that's all about. I've experienced that through a lifelong of following Jesus. There were times that it, this unmerited favor poured out. I denied him three times. Three times he came. Three times he ministered to me in his grace. May it be multiplied to you. That's what he's saying. Greater and greater and greater. We're saved by grace, unearned, unmerited favor. We must have it because we need it. We're sinners. God loves us, sent his son. And we tap into this gift of eternal life through faith, simply by grace. God just... Pours it out. It's yours for the taking, he says. So we're saved by grace. We couldn't earn salvation. We can only receive it as a gift from God. But his faith as a believer pours into us daily. Daily help, daily grace for failures, for doubts, for rebellion, for unfaithfulness. Praise God for his grace. God's desire for you and for me is that grace would abound. And for multiplied, multiplied peace as well. These past couple months have been troubling, to say the least. You guys didn't know how to navigate this. We didn't hear. We're running around like 
pants are on fire, thinking, what are we doing next? And it's been quite an experience. God's grace was sufficient, as it is in every, every way. But there's been a dark cloud. This dark cloud, it seems like it's just never going to go away. And it's permeated our hearts. It seems like every part of our life, it's been there. Can't escape it. We're reminded of it day after day after day. And if you watched any newscast, if you read any uh, reporting on it, you would have a rolling number in the state of Michigan, cases and deaths. This is just dark cloud. And, and, and Peter knew, he knew what it was to be troubled in his heart. And he knew that he could do something about it. 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety or all your fear on him, for he cares for you. Pray. You know, we have this way to deal with this. And I think I'll remind you again. Your intake of the word in times like this is critical. I think of how important that is. 24-7, we hear the negative reporting. We can open God's word and see and hear from him and be given every reason to have hope. This isn't bigger than our God. It didn't surprise him. So Peter knew what it was and knew what you could do with your, with your anxiety, with your fear. You cast it on him. Give it to him. Give it to the Lord because why? He cares for you. You know, he's seen you in every moment in this pandemic. He knows all your fear, all your frustration, all your hesitation, all your what-ifs that come to your mind. He's seen and he knows every one of them. Through faith, we have peace with God. But through prayer, voicing our concern, our trouble, and dependence, we can have the peace of God. This is a familiar text to all you guys, but I'm doing like Peter, right? I'm stirring you up by way of reminder. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. That's how you approach God. You pray. I mean, we pray because we need him. We pray because we're desperate. When we pray, we are saying, you're Lord. I need your help. You pray with Supplication, be specific with thanksgiving. Let's not forget that. Count your blessings and let your requests be made known to God. Look at this peaceful promise. And the peace of God. We have peace with God through faith. We're justified, declared right. We have the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension. I have to tell you, there were times during these past couple months when I was absolutely at peace with God, it was a, a, it was a blessing from him. Everything was right in my mind because he was on the throne. But you know what else happened too? I didn't stay there all the time. Maybe you did, but I didn't. And there were times when I would have an anxious heart and look at stuff going on around me and say, Lord, okay. I'm feeling this inside. What do I do with it? I pray. Give me that peace. Give it to him. There's a promise there. You see it? Uh, this, the peace of God, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Give it over. Give it over. Give it over. We have a, a, a you know, our faith is precious in identity, in association, and in desire. And Peter says this, for the listener... I'm praying that God's grace would be multiplied, that God's peace would be multiplied. And that's God's desire for you and I today. That's it. We have a daily bread, a daily grace that is sufficient for every need, grace upon grace, and we have peace with God as we give it over, give it over, and give it over. So let me finish up here. Is this precious faith your possession? In other words, have you ever come to a point in your life when you've realized I have not measured up to God's requirements of what it is that he wants from us? I've lied. 
I've coveted, I'm a sinner. Have you ever come to that point? Have you understood that God has provided for you a Savior? And that Jesus is the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Have you understood that he's the way, the truth, and the life? No one comes to him, jumps to the Father, but through him. That there's only one way, and that's faith in Christ. Have you come to that point? Have you ever cried out to God and said, I know I'm a sinner. I'm asking you to save me. He'll do just that, and you will have new life. You'll be born again. It's God's grace will flow. If you've never trusted him as Savior, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to make that choice. I pray that what you would. What about you who know him? What about you who know him? The, the Spirit of God through the apostle has set before us some amazing truths here about this precious faith. What a possession. What a Savior. May grace and peace increase in your heart. But I want to ask you this. Are you serving him? It, what is life like for you? What is your pursuit? Is it things? Is it a position? Is it prestige? Is it have others serving you? Or are you about this? Today, Lord, here I am. Use me. Direct me as imperfect as I am. I need your help, but I want to be used to you by you. You are my Lord. You're my master. My life is yours. That's what God wants. If you go there... You will enjoy the greatest freedom you've ever had in your life. I'll illustrate it this way. There's some train tracks down the, just down to the south here, quarter mile. Those train tracks, that train follows those tracks. That train runs like it needs to run when it's on those tracks. Those tracks are there so that train can function properly and get to its destination back and forth. When that train varies from that track, it cannot function as it needs to function. When you and I set aside following the Lord and chase other things, we're not enjoying freedom. Matter of fact, a lot of times we ended up captured by some sin or captured some other way. We're distracted. Friend, freedom in Christ is to be his bond slave. That's what it is. May grace and peace be yours, multiplied greater than the dandelions in the UP today. May it be yours. God wants that for you. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you for the opportunity to serve you through Jesus. Father, grow me in my service to you. Grow these worshipers in their service to you as we release our own desires, our own wants, our own little kingdoms to follow Jesus. Multiply peace, multiply grace. Father, bless your people. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.